welcome to um, Center for, NAM Center for Korean Studies, um, Korea Foundation Graduate Fellow Presentations. Uh, my name is No Jin Kwak. I'm a director of the NAM Center. Um, so we have uh, three fellows presenting, I believe, a fabulous presentation today. Um, Korea Foundation gave us a generous uh, gift and that allow us to um, have this fellowship program. Um, through this fellowship, we could provide full funding for uh, normally two students a year. And uh, we have a first class of these fellows last year, in 2009 and 2010. And we have uh, three fellows today, and each will present their research that they have worked on uh, during their fellowship year. Um, so what we'll do is um, each person will present their work for about 20 minutes. And uh, at the end of this uh, the third presentation, we'll have a Q&A session. And also we have a small reception prepared down next room. Mm -hmm. So if you stay, um, we have uh, some kimbap and uh, some drinks, so that's what's coming. Um, we have another, just uh, as an announcement, we have another uh, a, a talk tomorrow by the Professor a Andrew Schmidt on North Korea tomorrow at four o'clock um, in the um, uh, Department of East Asia uh, and Culture, Language and Culture uh, on, at, on Thayer Street. Um, so you will get the uh, flyer and also there will be an announcement about the talk as well. So first speaker today is uh, Sun Jae Hwang. Uh, he's a PhD candidate in the Department of Sociology. Sun Jae's research is on social stratification and inequality in Korea, and also his interest in globalization. During his fellowship year, he um, participated in the International Sociological Association and American Sociological Association conferences to present his work. And uh, today's talk is titled uh, Neoliberalism, the grammar to read uh, contemporary South Korean society. Uh, his talk uh, discussed the impact of the uh, neoliberal free market politics on the increase in the inequality and polarization in Korea since the 1997 Asia uh, financial crisis. Here is Sanjay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kwok, for generous introduction. And actually, thank you all for coming uh, today to support and to celebrate our special event together. Uh, my name is Sonje Hwang, and I guess you should go back to the beginning. <laughs> and I am a PhD candidate in the Department of Sociology. Before I get started, uh, uh, on behalf of 2009 and 10 Korea Foundation Graduate Fellows, uh, uh, let me first uh, express our, our sincere appreciation to the NAM Center for Korean Studies and the Korea Foundation for their generous support over the past years, and actually for today, providing us a venue like this for public uh, presentation and dem uh, discussion. I know uh, the opportunities like this are rare for, Korean, uh, for graduate students like us, so in that regard, I, uh, we are particularly grateful to Professor Kwok and Ji Young Lee uh, for <coughs> all their help and advice to make today's event possible. So as a very small token of my appreciation, I'd like to share some findings and implications from my uh, dissertation research that I have worked on for some years now. And the title of today's talk is Neoliberalism, the Grammar to Read Contemporary South Korean Society. Uh, let's take a look at the outline of my 20 minute or so presentation first. First, the social problem of contemporary South Korea. Uh, if you have paid enough attention to the news and issues of South Korea recently, you may have heard of the words like increasing inequality and polarization, widening gaps between the rich and poor, and the privatization of public enterprise such as national healthcare system and the national airport, way more often than before, right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> and you may uh, believe that these social phenomena are nothing new but some unavoidable natural consequences of economic growth and advancement to which South Korea is no exception. Maybe. But as a sociologist, I question uh, the legitimacy of these claims and argue that the recent rise in income inequality and polarization is a relatively new social phenomena disguised in an old and familiar format. And we should pay due attention to this trend. Otherwise, this is going to be the social problem of South Korea in the near future, as it has been the case for other, for some other uh, uh, developed countries that experienced this phenomenon before South Korea. So why do I uh, believe that this is a new social phenomenon, even if social inequality and fluctuation of the level of inequality have always existed as long as human uh, history? Because I believe that behind these recent trends lies the rise of uh, neoliberalism, 
that has been the dominant political economy of development, at least for three decades, uh, for the last three decades worldwide, and for about a decade or so in South Korea, particularly after uh, the 1997 Asian financial crisis. And as you will see in a minute, um, the empirical and theoretical evidences that I have gathered are strong enough to claim that the association between the rise of neoliberalism and the rising inequality is causal rather than coincidence. Next, then why do I care about these new social phenomena? As I have observed in the, in the early adopters of neoliberalism, such as the United States and the UK, uh, the rise of neoliberalism and inequality have shown significant negative impacts on social stability and cohesion. And the concentration of uh, income and wealth in the hands of few necessarily uh, resulted in the limited social mobility and hope disparities dis uh, derived from individual socioeconomic differences. And I believe this is neither a fair nor just society, which the current Lee myung Bak administration have recently started a campaign for. So I conclude this talk with some policy suggestions that could help South Korea avoid the same problems and mistakes that the early adopters of neoliberalism have experienced for the last three years or so. So uh, let's talk about numbers first and see whether the level of income inequality in South Korea is indeed rising. And Gini coefficient and income quintile share ratio are the two primary measures of income inequality. And in general, the higher the numbers and, and the more unequal the income distribution is for that society, although the metrics of the two measures are, are different. So the blue, li blue solid line here represents the change in Gini coefficients of the South Korea between 1990 and 2008. And as you can see, uh, it was pretty stable in the early and mid 1990s, but substantially increased after year 1997, when South Korea was hit hard by the uh, Asian financial crisis. And we can find the same pattern for the other measure of income inequality. Okay. And this time, as a measure of a polarization, uh, I've included another graph which shows both the absolute and relative poverty rates of South Korea during the same period. And as you can see, uh, the absolute poverty rate in uh, red line has been stabilized after a blip in 1998, but the relative poverty rate uh, uh, in blue line constantly increases since 1997. And this implies that Although the absolute level of poverty may have been back in control, but the relative gaps between the poor and the rest are actually increasing, uh, thus the intensified uh, polarization across different social strata since the 1997 Asian financial crisis. Uh, what makes these trends in inequality and polarization more interesting and problematic at the same time is the fact that the overall economy of South Korea actually quickly recuperated from the 1997 crisis right after. The annual GDP growth rate, red line, red line uh, instantly came back positive just in a couple of years. And the unemployment rate, uh, blue line, has also been falling since the hike in 1997. So what's the big picture that we can uh, draw from these graphs? The bottom line here is that uh, South Korean economy surprisingly quickly recovered from the worst economic recession since the Korean War. But not all, but only select few social groups have benefited from the strong economic comeback since the crisis, which directly translated into the rising inequality and polarization. Okay. So now we know that income inequality and polarization have been particularly exacerbated since 1997, and it has a lot to do with the Asian financial crisis in that same year. Then let's see what kinds of socioeconomic changes made in the wake of the 1997 crisis that triggered the, inset, the onset of the rising inequality. Uh, I believe there exist three primary factors that contributed to the onset of rising inequality in relation to the uh, 1997 Asian financial crisis. The first, uh, the disproportionate impact of economic crisis. Just like regular economic crisis in general, the impact of economic crisis is not proportionate, but highly contingent on pre-existing pre individual socioeconomic circumstances. So as a consequence, 
Different social groups are differentially affected by the same economic crisis, and the social economic gaps between the groups tend to enlarge uh, in the wake of economic crisis in general. And second, the initial mismanagement of the crisis by the International Monetary Fund and Korean government also exacerbated the problem. You remember that South Korea had to borrow then the record high $57 billion from the IMF in order to pay the massive amount of uh, short-term debt during the crisis. And as a condition uh, of the bailout, the IMF required the government to implement a certain set of short-term crisis management measures, but unfortunately it failed, I believe, and causing unreal unnecessarily high level of bankruptcy and unemployment in the following year. And third, which I believe a crucial factor for subsequent rise in inequality as opposed to the uh, initial gap in inequality, is the implementation of the so-called neoliberal structural adjustment program in the wake of the 1997 crisis up until now. Along with the short-term crisis management measures, the IMF also required the Korean government to carry out a set of long-term structural reforms as a condition of the law. And although that implied an overhaul of the conventional development model of South Korea, and it was almost obvious that the short-term outcomes would be, uh, could be disastrous, disastrous, the government was actually more than willing to implement the reform policies taking advantage of the crisis situation. And actually, it would be uh, nice to talk about uh, all the political background of the government decision but here today. But uh, I guess in the in interest of time, I focus more on the uh, contents of the neoliberal structural reforms that directly influenced the rising inequality since the crisis. Okay. Um, okay, before we talk about the details of the neoliberal structural adjustment program, Let's briefly talk about what neoliberalism actually is, which the neoliberal program is based on. Neoliberalism, as a continuance and a redefinition of a classical economic liberalism, is a set of ideology and accompanying political and economic practices that believe in the fundamentality of self-regulating markets, along with a proactive role of state as a guarantor of the uninterrupted market functioning. So as opposed to the concept of the post-war welfare state or a regulatory government, the proponents of neoliberalism promote packages of socioeconomic policies that secure a market-friendly environment for free movement of financial capital and profit, no trade barriers between nations, and the retrenchments of the state in favor of the market because they believe in the idealized efficiency of self-regulating market for the distribution of goods and services, and market is the solution for most socioeconomic problems not the government. So basically, uh, neoliberalism argues for a total reconfiguration of a market and society relationship according to a market principle of competition and efficiency rather than to a social prin principle, not giving much consideration to the possible market failures and negative outcomes of a uh, free market oriented socioeconomic configuration. And the primary example of that is increasing inequality and polarization. And you can think of the United States or the United, uh, uh, United Kingdom since the Reagan and Thatcher administration uh, when it comes to the practical images of neoliberalism and uh, neoliberal governance. And the neoliberal structural adjustment program, primarily created by uh, the IMF, IMF, is nothing but the realization of the neoliberal principles into the concrete set of social, economic, and political policies. Again, the overarching principle is simple. Reconfiguration of state, business, and labor according to a free market mechanism. So when it comes to the government reform, it means deregulation of the market and privatization of a public enterprise, such as national health care system, telecommunication and electricity that you have seen in the past years of South Korea and in the US and the UK for the last 30 years. And for business sector, they emphasize that transparency and accountability defined by the Anglo-American model in which instant profits for stockholders are more valued over long-term strategies, strategies of the owners uh, that uh, the Japanese uh, German model, German model more emphasizes. And finally, which is directly related to the increasing inequality and polarization trends, the casualization of labor, um, which means 
now it's okay uh, to hire, fle uh, flexibly hire and dismiss workers according to a changing market situation. And if possible, non-permanent workers are always preferred over permanent workers because of the cost. So let's go back to uh, the South Korea at the time of the 1997 crisis. As I said, uh, for various political and economic reasons, South Korean government was more than willing to implement the set of the neoliberal reforms that I just initiated in the previous couple of slides. And even if it meant that overall, or even the abandonment, uh, actually, even if, uh, sorry, even if it meant the overhaul or uh, the, the abandonment of the long cherished Korean development state model that South Korea had effectively utilized from the 1960s up to the early 90s, South Korean government has been slowly making the transition to the neoliberal re the regime over the last decade or so since the 1997 crisis. So again, here are the examples of uh, the primary mechanisms that link the neoliberal reforms and rising inequality in South Korea since 1997. Overall, the introduction of free market principles to almost all socioeconomic arenas is the most critical factor. And when it comes to the details, tax cuts for the top income and wealth groups, and accelerated casualization, casualization of labor, and subsequent decrease in unionization, and less public spending for social welfare, which all sum up to the creation of the general environment in which the rich get richer and the poor get poorer without much social safety net. And this is why we observe uh, the substantial increase in inequality and polarization in South Korea, particularly after the 1997 Asian financial crisis. And as I said at the beginning, what concerns me uh, most is the negative social consequences of the uh, rising neoliberalism and inequality. And among the many, I'm particularly interested in the erosion of social stability and cohesion aspect, which includes uh, the increased feeling of relative deprivation and uh, constant stress under competition without much so social safety net, and disappearance of class, class ladder for social mobility, and social economic disparities translated into hope disparities. And what I meant by uh, hope that disparities is the differences in uh, aspirations uh, by social economic conditions. And it's almost 20 minutes. So and before we conclude, uh, let's take a look at some other indicators of uh, social disintegration that attracted much of public's attention recently. First, falling total fertility rate, uh, which is one of the lowest uh, uh, in the world right now. And the falling, uh, the marriage rate is falling, and while the divorce rate increasing. And the most problem, problematic of all is the increasing suicide rate, which is the uh, highest among the OE 33 OECD countries uh, for the last five consecutive years. And again, I'm actually not here uh, arguing for a causal relationship between uh, the rising neoliberalism and inequality and these symptoms of social dis disintegration that I have just shown. But it would be also hard to deny that there exists at least some partial association between the two factors. So let me conclude with some thoughts and suggestions about the recent, recent neoliberalization of South Korean society. So in order to contain, if not to reduce, the rising inequality, it is critical to change the way we think about inequality, market efficiency, and social welfare. First, uh, rising inequality is not a natural outcome of economic growth, but, but a structured outcome derived from specific policies and institutions. Second, market is a good thing most of the time, and I agree, uh, but market efficiency and competition should not dominate all the social organization of economic activities. There are some areas where social contracts and social uh, fairness should be concerned uh, before the market efficiency. And third, spending on social welfare and enhancement of a social safety net is not just cost that negatively affects market economy and growth, but an important investment on human capital that could function as a foundation for further economic growth. So in this regard, I believe that 
timely implementation of social policies that enhance the equality of opportunity, now, I'm not talking about the equality of outcomes, in which more people can start on a fairer socioeconomic ground is more critical now than before. Thank you. Thank you, Sun Chen. Um, next um, is Youngji Chang. Um, she's a PhD student in communication studies. Um, she's interested in Korean media and culture, globalization, and feminism studies. Um, last year was her first year in, in the PhD program, but she has a really active, um, very productive year, um, presenting three papers at um, conferences, including one that um, garnered the top paper award at a conference. Um, today's talk is titled um, as the Cultural Politics of Producing Women's Programs in South Korea, Own Style and Its Interaction with Global Media. Youngji's talk centered around a cable channel in Korea called um, Own Style, which targets 20 to 35 years old women, uh, female viewers, and she'll discuss cultural politics of the production of a women's program in Korea with Own Style as a case. Please welcome Youngji. Thank you. Hi, my name is Young Chi Cheng, and I um, I'm in second year in PhD program at the Department of Communication Studies. And uh, as Professor Kwak introduced me, I'm interested in media globalization and gender, uh, with a specific case of Korea, South Korean. And I give actually this talk to my department. We have first year project uh, presentation, which I. Um, um, which I actually uh, give the similar talk. So, but I'm gonna elaborate a little bit more parts and I'm gonna incorporate some of the uh, uh, suggestions or critics that I got from the, my first year, pro uh, first year pro presentation uh, into my talk today. So my title, uh, my presentation titled is Cultural Politics of Producing Women's Programs in South Korea, uh, Own Style and Its Interaction with Global Media. All right. Um, so, as sort of Sun Jae Wang talks about it, a lot of things happened in the 1990s, right? So, uh, late 1990s and early 2000s, a lot of things happened, not, not just in terms of economy, but also in relation with women's roles and um, other kind of feminist concerns. So, issues pertaining to women's roles and gender came to the forefront of public life. Uh, and it has been observed in various uh, sectors, including political sense and economics and social cultural aspects. So for instance, uh, President Tae Jung Kim um, from 1998 to 2003, he uh, created a excuse me, Ministry of Gender Equality in 2003. So perhaps arguably the, the concerning to women's issues becoming more relevant uh, in this period rather than 1980s where the feminist movement has been happening in South Korea. Um, sorry, I'm not really technical savvy, I guess, here. It's really different, this one. So when these kind of changes on the way, uh, uh, it seems that to me the television industry also sort of working on uh, changing uh, working on uh, uh, represent the changing notions of women and women's roles in femininity in South Korea. And for instance, the shows like My Name is Kim Samsun or Native Moon Kim Samsun, which was uh, aired on NBC in 2004, which has a lot of, uh, uh, it, which received the numerous awards and have high ratings, became really popular not just in South Korea, but also in other countries, which produced spin-offs. Um, so for one of the instances is that in Philippines, which uh, uh, was produced as uh, Akosi Kim Samsun, and the left one is the Korean uh, Kim Samsun, uh, my name is Kim Samsun, or my lovely Kim Samsun, which is sort of the same title. And the next one is the Filipino version. And not just Kim Samsun, but at this time, I'm sorry. Um, uh, a number of similar TV shows happened, uh, came out to the broadcasting industry in South Korea, and there's some of the examples, such as The Woman Who Wants to Marry, or The World Miss Die Girl, Watch a Fox, uh, Get Call, Us Jang, Tauchers of Spring, Nine and, two, Nine and Two Outs in My Sweet Soul, The Woman Who Still Wants to Marry. So you can see that there's sort of pr proliferation of single woman characters. So. When this was happening, the another place that we can look at 
um, to examine how the industry try to incorporate the changing uh, and changing norms of women's roles and femininity is that a uh, lifestyle TV show, uh, lifestyle TV channels that was happening that was emerging just during this period. So, for instance, Tonga TV was came out uh, 1993, and GTV, which belonged to Jinro, which is the uh, uh, soju, uh, the product, the company that produces Jilo soju. Which if, if you guys know what I'm talking about here. <laughs> Uh, on style, which uh, came to 2004, and other um, uh, TV network, which is called Olive, which is belonged to the CJTV, which is also belonged to the Samsung. So among this, I'm interested in looking at on style because of the uh, various reasons, which uh, on style was created in February 2004. And I want to study on style as an object of analysis because it, it is considered uh, publicly the most popular and known lifestyle channel. And also it was created in the transnational, excuse me, trans, trans, transitional moment of the cable, Korean cable TV industry after the Asian financial crisis in 1997. So there's sort of connection that what Sun Jae Hwang is talking about that I want to sort of talk about this further uh, later in my argument. And also one of the characteristics is that it is created under um, all media, which is a media conglomerate, one of the media conglomerates in South Korea, uh, which is used to be uh, owned and operated by Orient Inc., Orient Inc., um, which is just purchased by CJ Media, which is uh, also owned by Samsung in August 2010. And is, it is interesting case that how this channel is interact with a lot of different kinds of global media uh, uh, companies such as Time Warner, HBO, and MTV. So I believe that analyzing this channel opens up opportunities to address the relationship between media globalization and gender, which I'm interested in in my uh, PhD program. So as I study media globalization and gender and those relationships, intricate relationship between these three um, different um, aspects, uh, I looked at very um, different kinds of literature that deals with this kind of uh, uh, um, subject. And I found that there's a dominant sort of paradigm of studying media and globalization, which it talks about flow. Um, so in, 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 for instance, where the media of products is uh, flowing to other countries. And then a lot of studies like that just talk about the power relation between the countries that the flow represents. Um, so while this kind of study is more becoming dominant, there's uh, some critical culture uh, scholars trying to intervene this kind of paradigm of the media globalization study and say that we have to focus on uh, not just the numbers and the flow itself, but we have to focus on cultural identities and how it affects the flow as well. So the, inc uh, the cultural identities including issues of gender and sexuality in, um, and other kind of stuff. Um, so gender has been examined in um, uh, primarily within reception studies in varied social culture uh, context. So my issue, my the, my issue was that uh, there's no such studies that it, uh, talking about industry, how industry try to incorporate those kind of social changes, and this is what I want to examine for my study. And uh, indeed, television industry and gender has been uh, one of the core uh, subject that uh, scholars talked about in mostly in UK and US. Um, but I'm interested in going beyond this point to uh, study non-US or UK uh, industry industrial context. So, and this is significant because women-centered television programs are now uh, globally circulating but also not only global circulating, those kind of programs have impacted on programming practices in other countries. Uh, and so there are a lot of examples we can think of and we can think about how shows such as Alan McBeal or Sex in the City has been circulated in other countries and how shows like Project One Way has been uh, produced there in lo local versions in other countries, including South Korea and Canada and Norway and other many countries. Then what I'm interested in to knowing is that, so in what ways does gender shape selection, acquisition, scheduling, and programming of globally circulating television shows in companies like OnStyle? So in answering this, this kind of questions, my uh, study trying to examine the cultural politics of the production women's programs in South Korea with OnStyle as a case study. And throughout this paper, uh, this 
presentation, I argue that Owen style relies on globally circulating television programs in order to articulate its identity as a woman-oriented television channel and also in order to mediate, mediate between local needs and global ideas regarding femininity. And I want to know the sort of negotiating between the globe and the local, or we can say perhaps Korean, non-Korean, and the process of negotiating. This is exactly what I'm looking at. Uh, and here, the concept of sammang sang, which means in Korea, envy or desire, uh, lies at the heart of the process of the negotiation, so which I'm gonna talk about. And uh, my other argument going uh, farther from the first argument uh, is that new woman-centric television shows in South Korea emerge out of this, this process of mediation, which requires negotiation and resolution of uh, the tension aroused between um, global and the local. And uh, in doing so, the own style moves beyond envy, desire to grapple with creating stories and characters that evoke empathy among viewers. So methods. So this is a really um, media studies kind of methodological uh, uh, choices that I took. Uh, Julie Dutch, which is a professor in uh, University of Mich uh, Wisconsin and Madison, came up with this an idea called Circuit of Media Study, model in 2004. So she says that she argues that to look at a certain kind of media artifacts, we have to study a lot of different things that sort of surrounding this media text, including reception, uh, different aspects, including reception, production, and then other kinds of social or uh, social context. Yet, because I can do the whole thing for this, um, my uh, presentation, I'm primarily uh, interested in looking at the relationship between production and in social historical context. So as I follow the media industry uh, studies, I uh, try to incorporate other kinds of methodological uh, choices that other professor, um, other scholars have made, such as interviewing media executives and try to press and or, or, or archival materials and then some senses of ethnographic observation, which I didn't really include in my paper uh, um, or this presentation and other kinds of textual analysis. So in 2010, summer, I went to Korea and I uh, interviewed media, ex media executives in, uh, at Onstas. It was really a good experience for me. So in order to understand how Onstar try to produce idea of femininity, one has to realize how this network try to conceptualize the audiences or perhaps ideal audiences. And then they try to, uh, the Onstar try to produce conceptualized audience based on two different kinds of factors. Number one, demographic. So um, Onstar try to focus on 20 to 34 years old professional single woman living in urban areas. So it's sort of trying to uh, narrow their uh, target audiences. And it is important to understand how this kind of conceptualization of uh, audience sort of affect the way, the way in which they uh, represent women. In terms of psychographic, also I try to focus women who are interested in not only fashion and beauty, but also in various kinds of cultural activities or experiences. Uh, such as going to music uh, performances and uh, theater uh, programs and, uh, and so on. So in other words, a single working woman with a lot of cu curiosities are the, uh, the ideal um, uh, audience that the own style try to construct. Then the question comes, how does own style try to appeal this group of women? And my, uh, and my argument uh, to answer this question is that the own style try to focus on globally circulating media programs to appeal to this uh, group of women. And it is revealed in, in its, its scheduling and programming practices. And I have looked at a lot of different ways in which you try to schedule um, and try to bring the components from foreign products into their uh, own programming practices. And I looked at how the uh, own style schedule foreign imports uh, perhaps more than 60%, but 60% because there was a limitation according to the law of their entire air, uh, air time and trying to place foreign programs uh, into uh, its prime time slots. So here I argue that the being global is uh, working as a strategy of distinction for on style. And there's a lot of examples I can uh, bring, but perhaps we can go further. And there's a lot of different uh, programs that on style try, um, 
import from uh, countries, but mostly from USA. And we'll talk about the consequences of this one. Um, then the, the next question comes that what kinds of trends or international programs does OnSET uh, focus on and why? So what will be the mechanism or what will be the standard that uh, uh, categorize the programs that the, the OnSET try to import in their programming? Is that, so when I'm trying to uh, discuss this question with the media executives at OnStyle, uh, I realized that Sammang Sang uh, was the, the important uh, keyword, the concept that they're trying to follow in terms of uh, importing foreign programs from other countries. And for instance, Cheyang Kim, who's the channel director and creator, says, we select media contents that our target audiences would enjoy watching. If that's the only case, there are a lot of domestic programs, like uh, dramas, that this group of women would enjoy watching. But what we are seeking for is Sammang Sang, because Korean women have a strong desire to be global and uh, cosmopolitan. They want to be accustomed to foreign cultures like American, Japanese, and British culture. Onsai wants to be the most nimble communicator to deliver such cultural needs. Um, then in discussing also, I realized that Sex and the City is sort of the killer example that uh, Onsai try to follow. Um, so as uh, Onsai tried to put Samang Sang forward as a key standard that they, they distinguish what kind of programs that they want to, that they want to uh, uh, in import from other countries, they try to op operationalize Samang Sang in two different ways. And the reasons why Samang Sang is, uh, what kind of Samang Sang uh, they're looking for. The, the first one, the first way in which um, Onsai trying to operationalize Samang Sang is that um, how Samang Sang, I mean, the kind of Samang Sang, excuse me, that the positioned woman as sort of the domestic city, domestic uh, sphere. So for instance, Jayang Kim, the creator, says that in regard to Samang Sang, what we thought of as an example, uh, exemplar on the lunch, I'm sorry, it's, it's a long, it's a wrong, it's a wrong spelling, sorry. Lunch um, of the channel was a Sex and the City. I think the biggest difference of the show compared to the Korean television shows is this. In Korea, you can't see a woman outside of the family. We ought to have a, you ought to have a baby and support your husband. What was really new about Sex and the City was that there was no family involved in story, stories. Most of Korean drama center on family. In contrast to that, in Sex and the City, stories involved around the individual characters and the stories or representation of family are secondary. So you can kind of see that how they are trying to position women uh, outside of the family situations. And another kind of Samang Sang that they're trying to focus on is that to uh, Samang Sang that stimulates, stimulate women's sensibility to express their desires more um, directly. For instance, Chong Su Sin, uh, who is the executive schedule, scheduling manager, says that when OnStyle launched for the first time and when licensed magazines came to Korea for the first time, what really appealed to our target audiences and what caused a fairly positive reactions, reactions from the audiences was that they provided some kind of sensibilities and style that didn't exist in Korea, which was what an actual woman had a sympathy, sympathy for. For instance, for example, in case of Sex and the City, it showed stories of women without the involvement of family, and these women were eager to um, directly express their needs and desires and to talk about consumption and sex. Such content representations didn't exist in Korea media before, and media, I'm sorry, and women audiences felt something new about this, those kind of representation and actually had fun in watching them. Um, however, uh, as Korean media has more uh, ha as Korean media companies now have more capacity to produce their own programs, there's just some different kind of strategies that Onsa had to take. Uh, so there's just something more than Samang Sang that local programs could provide for local audiences, um, which is the empathy. So, for instance, Chung Su Shin, the executive uh, uh, scheduling manager, again says, as the Western media culture of reality TV programs, which is sort of the dominant uh, genres that the company trying to uh, focus on, became more accepted and familiar with the Korean society. Why, uh, Western contents were replaced by local media products. Yes, since local contents are local, this is an important part for me, 
Uh, whereas audiences feel only samangsang from foreign programs, not only they not only feel samangsang but also feel empathy from local contents. This is why local contents are gaining more popularity these days. So here I argue that own style uh, blends samangsang and pepe in, in the creation of new kinds of women's programs for Korean TV. Uh, as a result of mediating, negotiating global ideas and local needs regarding femininity. So in understanding, so who's new Korean woman and how on style trying to produce or represent new woman, new Korean woman, uh, actually on style tried to sort of change their, uh, shift their gear towards different kinds of angles uh, within their very short history. The first, so they produce a lot of original programs that try to satisfy local needs. In the early years of the own style, they're trying to focus on successful women's lives, such as Singles in Seoul, which, used, which was my focus on my master's, di master's dissertation, uh, and wom Korean women on the top of the world talking about successful women around the world. But right now, uh, like currently, own style try to focus more on style and fashion such as the editors or style magazines, the fashion of Christ, are sort of belong to these kind of second categories of the new woman, a new Korean woman represented um, on site program, local programs. Yet, um, underst understanding the shift to more consumer uh, consumerist advantage related programs, I think that there's sort of ambiguity that belongs to um, ambiguity that belongs to this kind of a trend. Uh, in terms of positive sense, I think, and I argue. Consumption uh, on start try to uh, position or uh, 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 represent consumption as a site in which women's sensibility to express their desires revealed and um, where women can express their desires more directly and intense intensely. But however, there's of course a uh, side effect, which is that there's a class of subjectivities where, of course, Sun Jae Hwang was sort of talking about, and then this kind of uh, trend to uh, consumer stipend reality TV programmings would stereotype patriarchal ideology of femininity, which means that women only interested in fashion and beauty, not other kinds of uh, important social um, issues such as uh, poverty and other things. So, so what do we make sense of this? How do we make sense of new women on Korean TV? So although I don't really have any answers for this um, question, but I believe that in answer, to answer these questions, we have to sort of think about the argument that um, this Timothy Havenson and Amanda Lotz uh, made in their um, new coming book, upcoming book, which is called Understanding Media Industry. And these uh, authors argue that each medium in each country has its unique mandate. Mandate means which is the goal of the operation of the media. So I believe the contemporary Korean television is trying to fulfill both public and commercial uh, interests and mandates. And as an example, own style try to focus on both commercial interests as it focus on a full one, a young, urban, professional, single woman who actually have money to consume things and also public interest in that there's no sexual or classist contents or representation can be done in those kind of programming. So um, in analyzing own style, <clears throat> I uh, sort of try to think about the way in which how global circulation of television programming uh, had impacts or have different roles in different kinds of local contexts. In this case, South Korea and with own style. So I, I, I observed that global circulation of television programming tried to help it helped construct the channel identity as a lifestyle, tele, lifestyle channel or own style. And the, the uh, global, global programs or global circulating television texts are inspirational source providing some mang sung and also they provide an opportunity to experiment with their own programs, as we can see from examples such as The Singles in Seoul, which is sort of taking after Sex in the City. And, but uh, they sort of provide, they become a site where own style negotiate what is acceptable in the Korean society and what is not. So consequently, I argue that the specific way in which own style represent new Korean women, although we have to sort of asking what do you mean by new and what's new in new Korean women, 
is constructed through the possibilities of globally circulating television programs to offer alternative images of women and the constraints of them to appeal to peculiar, the peculiar sense of the Korean public. After I give my talk, I have a really great responses and suggestions. And one of, the, one of the suggestions that I got from Professor Chan, who is right there, so I'm really grateful that he gave me really great um, responses. So in the future, what I want to go with this um, project is that I'm interested in looking at style and aesthetics and popular culture and gender politics in South Korea in relation to the, its interactions with the global media. And then we can talk about how liberal, neoliberalism and sort of impacted in the way in which the Korea television programs or Korean television industry try to lifestyleize the Korea. So in doing so, we can talk about what has been continued and what has been changed in terms of representing women's roles and femininity. And I definitely need a more theoretical development um, uh, in doing so. And also, I didn't put it right here, but I'm also interested in looking at the audience, so how audience actually understand uh, other kinds of foreign programs. But again, um, this, kind of act, this kind of studies has been done by other, uh, for other scholars, such as Yuna Kim, who's coming next week, which I'm uh, really excited to see her. So although she's taking sort of uh, audience reception studies, but I'm interested in more sort of industrial analysis, but I think that I have to incorporate uh, um, reception audience studies to sort of complete my project. And future research, and this kind of changes are happening in other kinds of media contexts. So I'm looking, I would like to look at other kinds of media, such as magazines. Uh, so I'm look, I would like to, for my future research this coming summer, I'm, I'm interested in studying the licensed magazines such as Vogue and Korean Vogue, not just Vogue. Uh, which means that there has to be some, some sort of negotiation between Korean femininity and non-Korean femininity. And I'm interested in how this sort of uh, negotiation is happening, in, in what sense, in, in, and how, and why. So that's my talk for today, and I really appreciate it for my department and of, for the Center for, Nam Center for Korean Studies, who support me in a lot of ways, especially for uh, financial-wise. So I'm really, I'm really grateful to have this opportunity um, uh, for my this presentation and my talk. Thank you. Okay, um, last presenter uh, for today uh, is uh, Jin Yeon Kang. Um, she's a PhD candidate in sociology. Um, Jin Yeon is interested in the influence of colonialism upon the reconstruction of national and political community in the post-colonial Korea. Uh, she participated in the American Sociological Association during her fellowship year to present her work and continue to work on her uh, publication project. The title of her talk is Rethinking Colonial Heritages for Post-Colonial Politics in South Korea. And Jin Yeon's talk will discuss 1946 people's uprisings in Korea, the largest social movement during the U.S. occupation period. By analyzing the nature of the elements of the uprisings, um, Jin Yeon's talk will attempt to understand the relation between uprisings and the influence of Japanese, uh, Japanese colonialism. Please welcome Jin Yeon. Well, before the talk, I'd like to thank the Nam Center for Korean Studies for supporting my study with the Korea Foundation Fellowship that I received last year. Um, I'm truly grateful for that. Uh, my presentation today is based on one of my dissertation chapters. But before I get into that, let me briefly explain the historical context and broad topic of my dissertation first. My dissertation is about the relationship between colonialism and post-colonial politics and state formation. Um, the time period is from 1910, when Korea became officially colonized by Japan through 1948, when Sukman Rhee's regime was established in South Korea. Overall, my focus is on how Japanese colonialism formulated the internal conflicts among Koreans, and how those co internal conflicts were intensified under US occupation and and became critical source of separate nation state formation in South Korea. Um, I analyzed Japanese colonialism in several chapters of my dissertation. 
through the question of how colonial rule formulated the intra-Korean conflicts in economic, political, and ideological aspects, especially after the March 1st movement in 1919. But because of time constraint, today I'm going to focus on the U.S. Uh, occupation period, more specifically the 1946 People's Uprisings, which is the largest social movement during the U.S. occupation period. So through this particular social movement, I will show how colonial legacies became significant sources of social and political struggles among Koreans under the U.S. occupation. In September 1946, railroad workers in South Korea organized a general strike, which was followed by popular uprisings. On October 1st, Daegu, a city of North Gyeongsang province, became a center of protest, where women and children went to the city hall to demand rights, and union workers and students gathered at the railroad station. As people took over the police station, attacks against um, police officers and bureaucrats began to emerge, and the martial law was proclaimed. After the uprising in Daegu, similar incidents took place sporadically in other places, covering all provinces in South Korea until mid-December. In the map, shaded areas indicate at least one such incident. While the exact official statistics of the movement are unknown, it is estimated that about about 2 million people participated in the uh, strike and subsequent uprisings. And movement casualties included more than 200 policemen and about 1,000 participants. Because uprisings took place in each place in different time, details of each incident were different from place to place. But one of the characteristics that they shared was strong antagonism against um, police officers, bureaucrats, and wealthy landlords. Military government documents describe the brutal method people used to attack fellow Koreans as follows. In Daegu, faces and bodies of policemen were hacked by uh, axes and knives. The hands of policemen were tied, their, tied behind their backs and sharp pointed slate rocks were then thrown at them until they fell to the ground from rows of blood. This was followed with dropping large boulders on their heads, crushing them beyond recognition. In Wagwan, the police chief's eyes and tongue were cut out with rice knives before he was beaten to death. And in Sangju, five policemen were severely beaten and buried alive. The fact that even hospitals in Daegu refused to treat wounded policemen indicates how prevalent such strong antagonism against those who were attacked throughout the uprisings. So my question is, why was the target of the movement not the American military government but fellow Koreans? The fact that paper the fact that people mainly attacked fellow Koreans is especially puzzling if we consider the US, U.S. played an active role in exacerbating the economic and political situation. Moreover, given the massive casualties of uprisings, it is surprising that not even a single American official was attacked throughout the movement. In fact, an American who was uh, in Korea at the time said, quote, it was amazing to recall again that despite our active involvement, no harm had to come to a single American. They were merely settling their scores with the many forces which oppressed them under our rule, as they did under the Japanese. Unquote. By explaining how Japanese colonial rule influenced movement choice of targets as well as its eventual failure, therefore, I want to illuminate colonial legacies in post-colonial politics and state formation in South Korea. Throughout the course of um, Japanese colonial rule, strong anti-Japanese sentiment was developed in Korea. So the most important task in the liberation phase was to remove any colonial legacies and reconstruct an independent nation state. 
To achieve this goal, various political organizations and social associations uh, immediately began to emerge, most notably the Committee for the Preparation of Korean Independence, 조선 건국 준비 위원회, which changed its name to the Korea, Korean People's Republic, 조선 인민 공화국 at the national level and people's and people's committees 인민 위원회 at the local level. The policies of those organizations show dominant political orientation of liberation phase. While promising fundamental freedoms and absolute equalities for all Koreans, the policies made it clear that those who collaborated with the Japanese would not be considered members of national community, and thus they would not have equal rights. Under these policies, collaborators became um, became considered national traitors, 민족 반역자, and they were denied the right to their properties and right to vote. This clearly shows that once the colonial rule was over, the strong anti-Japanese sentiment reinforced the exclusionary attitude toward those who collaborate, collaborated with the Japanese. But it should be also noted that during the uh, liberation phase, the definition of collaborators or collaboration in general was not clarified at all. Rather, they con it contained more like a symbolic meaning. The meaning of collaborator, collaborator became clarified through the US occupation period. When the US came to Korea, people enthusiastically welcomed it precisely because it brought about political independence from Japanese colonialism. But as soon as the US began its occupation rule, it became clear that the US brought another foreign rule rather than liberation. Through US occupation policies, the existing internal conflicts among Koreans became significantly intensified. Politically, the US denied any authority of political organizations with popular support. Instead, it largely revived colonial, colonial system and filled them with those who served the Japanese before. This in turn increased ideological tension between rightist and leftist. Economically, the US revived colonial economic practice such as grain collection program which in turn exacerbated economic conflict among Koreans. In this whole process, various groups had to adopt their own survival strategies, and therefore increasing their conflicts, and ultimately those internal conflicts culminated in the 1946 uprisings. Throughout the uprisings, Korean, Korean police officers and bureaucrats became the main target not simply because they worked for the US, but more importantly, because of their past conduct and relationships uh, since the colonial period. Park Tu Po, who experienced uprising in Daegu, says, oh, by the way, I'm going to use some quotes from now on. They are mostly based on my interview with the people who experienced both Japanese colonialism and the US occupation. Later, I saw him, a police officer, sitting on the street. He was bleeding. It looked like he had been beaten. Tens of people were surrounding, surrounding him. They shouted, this guy has burdened us. He should be beaten to death. He shouldn't stay alive. Whether men and women, they were cursing him. He was sitting on the street with his eyes closed. He was active in the conscription and draft for the war during the colonial period. After liberation, Collaborators like him ran away and looked for a mouse hole to hide themselves. But they were in high-ranking government positions again after the U.S. came. Grudges kept growing and growing. When the U.S. reappointed and supported those who benefited and, and served the Japanese colonial power, they began to seek their survival and revenge against people who criticized and attacked during the liberation phase. 
This, of course, in turn reinforced popular grievances and the perceptions of injustice. For example, Il Tse, another movement participant, says, during Japanese colonialism, there was a Korean chief at the township office in our village. There were any kinds of, when there were any kinds of disputes, he called for the police to break them up. He exempted those people he knew well from the, pol uh, from the first draft and instead forced others to go in order to increase his work performance. Right after liberation, people hit him in the head with shovels and threw him into a rice paddy. We thought that he was dead, but then he showed up in the town again and was reappointed by the US. Later, people attack, attacked him during the uprisings. Of course, the economic situation is another important reason for the movement. After the US introduced free market policy, the price of rice increased almost 300 times, and the average, of average cost of food was 100 times higher than before. The problem was that while most people were suffering from severe economic condition, some dominant groups manipulated the situation to increase their economic power. Kang chang Dok, another movement participant, says, On my way from work, I saw a lot of stuff piled in the street and people surrounding it. It was a high government employee's house. He'd lost favor with the people during the Japanese colonial period. They searched his house and found a lot of rice, sugar, and cotton fabric. This kind of, this kind of stuff was really precious back then. People didn't take the stuff for themselves, but put it in the street and shouted, see this? Now people are poorly clothed and suffering from hunger, and this son of a bitch is living well against the people. They cursed and shouted, he should be beaten to death. Well, it is worth emphasizing that even when it's very unorganized and impulsive collective action like this case, people didn't take, people didn't take the officials' properties. Instead, they showed their anger toward those who prospered at the expense of Korean people with the help of the US. Although economic problems um, clearly facilitated the uprisings, hunger itself doesn't seem to explain the deeper meaning and motivation of the uprisings. To understand why people so strongly protested against fellow Koreans, then it is critical to consider the meaning of liberation. The following statement highlights what liberation meant for m most Korean people. After liberation, he, the colonial officer, was maintaining the same living condition as he had during the Japanese colonialism. People considered going to the village office during the uprisings as a chance to revenge vicious grain collection. They destroyed the village office and put documents in the fire. Staff at the office couldn't stop them. Police and other officials ran away. People got excited and went to the village where the, tar where the target of their resentment, the vicious pro-Japanese official, lived. His house and assets were wrecked and burned down. People came back to the town after putting even his family treasure in the fire. That night was like a village fest for them. Having homebrewed wine and turning red-faced, they enjoyed their complete retaliation and triumph as if, as if it had become a truly free world. If the meaning of liberation was to get rid of any colonial legacies and reconstruct the national community, What's important here is that um, colonial legacies included not just institutional structures, but also they are already embedded in relationships among Koreans. The 1946 uprisings broke out when those internal conflicts among Koreans were combined in a particular historical conjuncture. It is, it is in this process that national fragmentation in Korea developed through Japanese colonialism, and then the US occupation. Um, 
in conclusion, I'd like to highlight three points. First, the influence of colonialism on post-colonial politics is contingent on particular historical processes. In Korean case, Japanese coloniali colonialism was not merely historical background for post-colonial politics, nor did it immediately uh, determine political changes. My argument is that the continuity from colonial to post-colonial period should be understood the process, through the process of um, liberation phase and the US occupation. Second, we need to pay more attention to the social consequences of colonialism in post-colonial changes. As we have seen, collaborators with the Japanese colonial power became considered as national traitors and they became also a target of popular protest. This shows how the meaning of membership in a national community can be changed through the historical process. In this regard, I argue that the social consequences of the colonial experience are one of the most profound colonial legacies that we need to reconsider. Finally, I want to emphasize the importance of internal conflicts as a historical source of separate nation state formation in South Korea. Of course, it is obvious that after Japanese colonialism, the US occupation in South and USSR in North in the Cold War circumstance played a so important role in national division in Korea. And I have no intention to you know, ignore or underestimate, underestimate that factor. What I want to suggest is that it is also important to understand some other historical factors, especially related to Japanese colonialism. With this argument, I'd like to mention some broad implication of my study for other um, post-colonial um, societies and finish my talk. Like South Korea, many societies had different forms of social and political conflicts. For example, India and Pakistan had a devastating civil war, and many parts of Africa also experienced some serious political eruptions because of their tribal and ethnic divisions in their post-colonial periods. The implication of Korean case for other post-colonial studies is that it is crucial to consider how colonial rule produced internal conflicts among the indigenous people, whether it's religious, ethnic, or class-based, and how such conflict plays a cru crucial role in, in their political changes and state formation in their post-colonial period. Thank you.